All right, all right. Fat Nation, today we're gonna to be talking about motion artifacts. That's why I'm doing some, you know, half jumping jacks here. But the idea is that in X-ray and in CT imaging, if you have motion, it actually degrades the image quality. And we're gonna go through the theory at a high level behind why the images are degraded when there's motion in X-ray and CT imaging. So you probably have a really good feeling of motion artifacts with photography that you're used to, especially if you've been using cameras for some time. When you have a relatively longer exposure time, you could get an image which looks like this. So this is a one second exposure time. This is actually an image that's kind of hard to even realize what's going on inside of this image. There's, there's something here in the middle, but it's even difficult to tell what this is in the image. So if we go to a shorter exposure time, that allows us to have a more clear definition of what's happening inside the image. And then even a shorter exposure time, you can see that in this case, we just have one 120th of a second for the time that this was taken over. And now you can really appreciate, this is actually my son who's been in some other videos on the channel as well. What he's doing is he's jumping off the couch, he's moving his arms up in the air, and that's why there's just tons of blurring in this one, but it's nice and crisp in this one. And this is the case when we have a relatively fast acquisition. In photography, we're really used to this kind of effect. And in regular X-ray imaging, it's kind of similar to this. Um, you think about if you're taking an x-ray image of your hand, obviously you wouldn't be doing it in a C-arm like this, but let's just imagine you take an x-ray image of your hand and someone were to come in, you had a nice x-ray image if there's no motion that looks like this, but if someone were to come in and give you a little coochie coo and a little feather there, and then you pulled your hand back just as the acquisition was being taken, number one, what is someone else doing in the room while you're taking the acquisition? Number two, why are they giving you the coochie coo with the feather? But what actually would happen here is you would have motion. If you pulled your hand back like this, you would have motion that's along this direction here. And because there's motion along that direction there, there's also gonna be blurring along that same direction. Ideally, if the object was supposed to be a point like this, it would get blurred along a line so that it gets spread out along the line. So number one, it's blurred, and number two, it has lower intensity because its same intensity is spread out over that line. So we can think about it if we start with a point, and then we imagine as you're moving the object, you can imagine that there's a few different points. You move it down further, you move it down further, move it down a little further, and if you imagine taking little snapshots along the way, and then you added up all those snapshots along the way, what you would actually get is this kind of a blurring function. So that's what happens in our standard X-ray imaging. Obviously, if you're moving in a direction that's not perpendicular to the direction that the X-rays are pointed, then it's more complicated because the angles start to change. But at a high level, it's still gonna be something like this, a blurring function based on the actual motion. And then how is CT different than this? CT, we're actually doing reconstruction. So instead of taking just one picture, like we are in X-ray, we're taking many pictures, like around a thousand pictures, at least usually to generate an image. So our source and our detector are rotating around the patient. So if there's motion during that acquisition, it's actually gonna show up during that reconstruction process and it's gonna be a little bit different than X-ray because X-ray doesn't actually need a reconstruction process. It just reports the image. So as we go around, especially you can think about the beginning, the very first view, and then you go around. And if we start to talk just about an axial reconstruction where you're just going in a circle, then your last view is right next to your first view. So they're very similar and they should really be reporting the same measurements. But actually if there's motion, the first view and the last view actually would be reporting different measurements. And because there's difference in between these measurements, that's going to cause what we call an inconsistency. And this could lead to additional artifacts. And sometimes these artifacts are what we call non-local. 
So the artifacts I showed you in x-ray, it was just a blurring. So you'd have the image and the blurring was relatively close to the actual anatomy. In this case, you could have artifacts that actually streak through the image. So we're gonna see if we look at just again, that before and after the very first and the very last view, and if there was motion in between them, how would that affect the image? And we also wanna talk about this from just kind of a simple standpoint. Imagine that our object that we're imaging is just a disc like this. And imagine our x-rays come in, they're close to parallel here in this drawing. But first we wanna talk about which direction would actually be worse to have motion in. The object can actually move during the acquisition, but if this is the direction of our first and our last view angle, we're taking x-rays along this direction, which direction would actually be worse in terms of the motion of the object? So if you think about it for a second, let's go through and we'll look at the two different cases. If the object moves in the left-right direction compared with if the object moves in the up-down direction. So if the object moves in the left-right direction, if this is our initial projection, so the x-rays that come through, we get a projection that looks something like this after we take our log. And if the object moves, you can now see that that projection, again, moved along this direction. So now there's a mismatch between these two. So if you think about what's the inconsistency now between these two, we can essentially take the difference between them, assuming they're basically at the same view angle. We could take the difference between them and then we can see what we're actually gonna get is a function that's bright on one side and then dark on the other side. So on one side, we're gonna be overestimating and on one side, we're gonna be underestimating how much attenuation we should have in our image. So what is that gonna look like in our image? If we look at our image, what's actually gonna happen is we should have an image that looks just like a circle, but in this area where we've overestimated, we're gonna project back a white streak. See our video on filter back projection if you're not familiar on the basics of how CT reconstruction works, but we do a process where we filter the data and we back project it along the direction over at which it was acquired. So we are essentially sending the data back from the detector to the source and depositing the information in the image along the way. So if we do that in this case, you can see we're now gonna end up with a bright streak on one side and then we're gonna end up with a dark streak on the other side because we underestimated the attenuation on the other side. So what does that look like in the case of our actual medical images? If we had a starting angle right here, then we went around the patient, and then the ending angle was also right here, and the lungs are right here in the middle. If we did just an axial scan and we used a full axial scan, what actually you would get if there was motion of the cardiac anatomy and then of the lung anatomy directly adjacent to the heart, you can see because that motion was actually in this direction that there's actually gonna be artifacts that are coming in this direction. So this is, gives you some kind of intuition as far as basic axial CT reconstruction. If in the case of head reconstruction, you had the start angle laterally on one side, you went all the way around the patient and then the end angle was also right here. If you had motion in this direction, you could also see streaks and they could look like this. So these artifacts here, like we talked about, are non-local because they're actually spreading out some of that artifact throughout the image volume in CT, which is different than an X-ray where that blurring is relatively local where there's motion. So then what if the object was actually moving in the other direction? If it was moving in the direction towards the X-ray tube. So if it was moving in the direction towards the X-ray tube, you can see there's a little bit of what we call beam divergence or the beam spreading out here, but it's not actually that significant because we're relatively close to the center of the volume. And in that case, if the object moves up, it just is gonna change the magnification slightly. So the object moves up, it changes the magnification slightly, but if we look then at the difference between the projection before and after motion, 
Now there is much less difference between the projection before and after motion than in that earlier case that I showed you. So what really matters is actually motion that is perpendicular to the direction that the x-rays are acquired in. Those are the types of motion that will actually generate really significant artifacts, whereas this type of motion, if you back project this small level of difference, you won't really notice it in the image volume. Just the takeaway is that the CT motion artifacts are highly dependent on the direction of the motion in addition to the magnitude of the motion. These artifacts are also non-local, so you can end up with streaks in the images, which is different than in the case of just X-ray imaging. So here's the case of a full scan like I showed you before. If you use all the full scan data, but if at the ends you taper the weights down a little bit so that the projections are given a little bit lower weight when you do the reconstruction, you can end up with actually significant improvements in those artifacts. This is the case of a lung anatomy. You can also see in the case of the brain, if we use the GE product is called True Fidelity for deep learning, when we're using deep learning and we're using that additional denoising, then gives us the freedom to also employ such a weighting function to reduce the motion artifacts. So you can see that the motion artifacts are significantly reduced in this case. You can also see this in the reformats. So a lot of times these kind of motion artifacts are thought actually to be something like beam hardening. You can see in this case with the true fidelity reconstruction and the better weighting function for this motion, that it was significantly reduced. Check out our video on filtered back projection because that gives you a sense of how the actual reconstruction is done and it will give you more intuition on how these artifacts are generated in our CT images coming up.